So UFC Fight Night Holloway vs Ellen is going to be coming up very soon. It is over a week away at the time of me recording, but I do want to give my early predictions for the card because it's a good one. We've got the return of Max Holloway after he lost to Volkanovski. You've got Arnold Ellen fighting him, who's up and coming, probably deserves the title shot if he beats him for sure. There's going to be some bangers on the card. There's some veterans on the card. This whole card is really good in my opinion. I'm really really looking forward to this card. So, let's just get start let's just get into it before we do though. My bet your US link and also we do have the We Want Picks membership 3-day free trial using my Artem code there. Let's get into it. Ed Herman is taking on Zach Cummings. Both guys haven't fought in a while. But Zach Cummings hasn't fought in a two and a half years in a fight which he actually dropped Alessio De Chirico on the feet at uh, the very, very end of the third round. Like like at the buzzer, he, he landed a head kick and dropped him. He won the decision there. Ed Herman hasn't fought in a year and a half where he lost to Alonzo Minifield. But man, he's like, he's 42 and a half years old now. Zach Cummings is 38 years old. Cummings hasn't fought again like since two and a half years. I almost like Zach Cummings as a sum, in a submission in this one here because he's got 12 wins by submission. Ed Herman's lost six times by submission, but I don't really know if Zach Cummings is going to shoot for takedowns. He's not a guy that's landed a lot of takedowns in the UFC. If takedowns are landed, they're probably more likely to come from the Ed Herman side, honestly, but I do have Cummings by decision. Maybe a submission could be live because Herman has been caught a bunch of times before. Zach Cummings has landed submissions over Trevin Giles, who was undefeated at the time. And he uh, took Trevor Smith to a decision. But anyway, um, the odds are in the Cummings side. He is minus 250 and Ed Herman is plus 200. I don't really know how I feel about betting on this fight. It's two older veterans of the sport. Both guys haven't fought in a long time. We don't necessarily know how they're going to look. And this fight is almost destined to be on the main card or if not on the main card, very close to it. Um, this belt order might be incorrect, but it's what I'm working with. Brandon Roy Val taking on Mateus Nicolau. I've got Mateus Nicolau here. I think he's going to be able to slow the fight down. Brandon Royval is very much a kill or be killed fighter. He's very aggressive on the feet. He gets the fight to the ground and he's very aggressive on the ground as well. But I think that Mateus Nicolau is going to be skilled enough to kind of be able to slow the fight down. And, uh, you know, have competitive moments on the feet if he needs to. He can get the fight to the ground as well. We just saw Nicolau get his first <laughs> and only finish in the UFC over Matt Schnell, which um, you could maybe even argue was a step down in competition after the David Dvorak win. But I, I think we're going to see Mateus Nicolau beat Brandon Royval by decision. When Brandon Royval loses, it is almost always by decision because uh, usually if he wins, man, it's going to be by finish. But if he gets taken to decision, it's usually because he's getting outpointed. Royval is going to be a live underdog here. I think um, there's also maybe some title, title challenger, title challenger status on the line here. I know Pantoa is almost definitely getting the next title shot. He weighed in as the alternate, but either of these two with a big win could maybe you know be knocking on the door as well themselves. So. I do have Nicolau. I've got him by decision here. Roy Val is going to be live. Roy Val is going to be live on the feet. He's going to be live to take the fight to the ground and try and get a submission. But I think Nicolau is going to be skilled enough to kind of evade Roy Val, outpoint him on the feet. If he really needs to, he probably could take him down and just try and be safe. But it's not the best idea. I do have Nicolau. He's a very slow underdog, but Roy Val inside the distance is always live with a Roy Val fight. He's a very exciting fighter. But I do have Nicolau minus 160 favorite thereabouts. We move up the card, you've got Gaston Bolaños taking on Aaron Phillips. Gaston Bolaños uh, has been signed to the UFC for quite a while actually. I think it was about six months ago he got signed uh, to the UFC and I was kind of like, what? Like this is a weird signing, it is. It is an odd signing, Gaston Bolaños is 6-3, and three. he had his whole career in Bellator and he's 1-2 and two in his last three fights and the guys that he beats in Bellator weren't like the best and the guys that he's lost to in Bellator weren't the best either. He lost to this guy called Daniel Carey and then he rematched him and then beat him by KO. He lost to Solo Hatley Jr. by split decision and he's getting KOs. All of his wins are by KO which makes sense why he's gotten signed. He throws a lot of spinning elbows, it's kind of like a specialty but he's very good on the feet. Um, I was very impressed by Gaston Blanios' striking, but the grappling is definitely a, a bit of a, a work work in progress, I would say. But Aaron Phillips isn't going to try and take him down. Aaron Phillips has been taken down many times in his UFC tenure. He's actually 0-3 in the UFC. I believe he got taken down something like, 
I think it was like six times or, or three, uh, the, the numbers are three, five, and six. <laughs> so I think um, it was six takedowns. He got taken down by five by Hoba, and then I think Shaw just took him down three times actually. But the thing is, Aaron Phillips just gets taken down. <laughs> but so that means that Aaron Phillips, you know, maybe he could go for takedowns against Gaston Bolaños. It is a very big weakness in Gaston Bolaños' game. When he did get subbed by the guillotine choke, it was kind of weird. Like, Gaston Blanc kind of just put his head, like, into the clinch, and Daniel Carey latched it up, and then kind of pulled Guillotine, and actually, he got, like, choked out, like, unconscious, it was actually quite, quite scary, but anyway, um, I do have Bolaños in the matchup, like, KO, I don't feel that good about it, though, like, I know, like, Aaron Phillips, it's more of just a fade on the Aaron Phillips side, you know, Aaron Phillips, he hasn't looked incredible in his UFC career, like, at all, He's a striker for the most part. I don't think he's going to try and wrestle with Gaston Bolaños. I got Bolaños by KO. He's a slight favourite, understandably. Minus 180, actually. He's a pretty big favourite, but... This is the... Aaron Phillips is probably the toughest challenge of his whole career, maybe aside from the Solo Hatley Jr. fight. Aaron Phillips genuinely might be the hardest guy he's ever fought. Um, so, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But I do have Bolaños. I think he's going to be so fast on the feet. I think he will be able to beat Phillips. Jocelyn Edwards taking on Lucy Pudilova. I'm picking an underdog in this one here. I do have Jocelyn Edwards. Jocelyn Edwards is a good Muay Thai striker. She is quite lengthy, lengthy as well. I know they're both listed at 5'8", but Jocelyn Edwards does have pretty long legs and she uses a, kick, a lot of kicks in her Muay Thai style. The problem with Jocelyn Edwards is her takedown defense isn't all that fantastic but it is improving it is definitely getting better she fought two times within two weeks of so Ramona Pasquale and Gion Kim and um, Lucy Pudilova just recently come back to the UFC after losing having a big losing streak in the UFC she went on a run in Octagon she got re-signed but Yanan Wu but also in that run she lost to Teresa Blader in an exhibition belt who was 18 years old at the time <laughs> so um yeah, Teresa Blade is in the UFC now, but still, um, I do have Jocelyn Edwards by decision. I think she can outpoint Lucy Pudilova on the feet. I think she's the much better striker. I think Lucy Pudilova will try and take her down, but Lucy Pudilova, throughout her MMA career, or in the UFC anyway, her takedown accuracy hasn't been that great. Jocelyn Edwards' takedown defense has been pretty bad in the past, but I do think Jocelyn Edwards will be able to get it done by decision. I think she can keep the fight on the feet and just be the better striker. You do notice the weight miss in her last fight, but that was because she took the fight on literally day's notice. So I don't blame the weight miss too much. I think she will have no problems making weight. I've got Edwards by decision here. I'm not very good at picking women's MMA. Um, usually with women's MMA, you've kind of just got to take like everything that makes sense and throw it in the bin. So what I just said is probably going to opposite's going to happen. I think Jocelyn Edwards will probably try to wrestle Lucy Pudilova. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a weird one. But Edwards is the underdog plus one fifteen, plus one forty, plus one fifty on some sports books. You can get her pretty wide, but I wouldn't bet this fight. I wouldn't trust um, your money on this fight. The next one here, I'm picking Daniel Zalhu, but I think he's also a slight favorite and once again I'm picking Zell Hoover but do not trust this man with your money he let us all down so much last time I'm actually just gonna check the odds right now even if he is the underdog I wouldn't trust him with my money he's about minus 115 minus 110 and minus 130 on some sports books but I'm picking Daniel Zell Hoover but man, like, do not trust Daniel Zalhuber with your money whatsoever. But I do think he gets it done. Daniel Zalhuber really impressed me on Dana White's Contender Series. He beat Lucas Almeida, and that win has turned out to be pretty good. Lucas Almeida's then gone on to win in the UFC himself. We look at Trey Ogden. He lost on the feet to Trey Ogden, and Trey Ogden was losing on the feet to, um... Oh, I forgot his name now, but the guy that Paddy Pimblett submitted, Jordan Levitt. Jordan Levitt was beating Trey Ogden on the feet, and then Trey Ogden beat Daniel Zalhuber on the feet, which is such a bad look. But Lando Venata is moving back up to 155 after a run at 145. I think Daniel Huber is going to be able to use his uh, reach, use his size, use his length to out-kickbox Lando Venata on the feet. Leonard Venata's an exciting guy. He's had a, such a such an up and down in the May career. You know, he debuted against Tony Ferguson on short notice. Put on a good fight there as well. But I've got uh, Daniel Zalhuber by decision by outpointing Venata on the feet in a very similar fight to the Dana White's Contender Series fight where he took a lot of damage in the first, but he came back big time in the second and the third round. But man, 
Don't put money on Zalhuva. I really, like, he let us down so much last time. I think it's going to take a couple of fights for me to trust him again. I am still picking him to win, though, because I do think this is a good matchup for him to win, especially Lando Venata moving back up to 155 from 145, but that's a rough one. And then the next one here is another pretty sketchy fight to bet, you know. I'm picking Piero Rodriguez by decision, but Jillian Robertson... I believe she's got the most finishes in Mormon's flyweight history, or at least she's drawn for most finishes in Mormon's flyweight history, because she's got a lot of submissions in the Mormon's flyweight, and she did just submit Rose Number Yunes easily in a grappling tournament, you know, and that's not really a good look for Rose Number Yunes whatsoever, but it is a good look for Julian Robertson, because Number Yunes come up as a grappler. Her striking kind of developed over time, and Piero Rodriguez is probably going to look to take down Jillian Robertson, which is not what you want to hear, but it probably is what she's going to do. She took down Sam Hughes five times. She outboxed Sam Hughes on the feet as well, but I think Piero Rodriguez, I think she'll be smart to keep this fight on the feet. Jillian Robertson is no joke on the ground. She throws up submissions. Almost all of her wins um, in the UFC and almost all of her wins in general are by submission. She's got eight wins by submission out of 11. If she wins on um, in the UFC, it is going to be by submission. I believe most of them are by, by submission. But Pierre Rodriguez, I don't think she should mess around on the feet with Jillian Robertson. I think Rodriguez is the better striker. She's got decent boxing, and that's where I'm kind of going to trust her to keep the fight. I think she keeps the fight on the feet. Jillian Robertson's striking isn't too incredible, but her grappling is amazing. And I feel like Pierre Rodriguez, she's well-rounded. She can wrestle if she wants to. I think she'd be smart if she didn't. And I think that um, she's going to box Jillian Robertson for three rounds and uh, win a decision that way. So I'm giving getting Piero Rodriguez as my pick. Her win over Valeska Machado as well has aged incredibly well. Valeska Machado has gone on a crazy run in Invicta FC since then. So I've got Rodriguez. She's actually a slight underdog on one sports book, but for the most part, she is the favorite about minus 125. But you can get um, her as the underdog as well on other sports books too. But would I put money on this fight? Absolutely not. Not even like an over-under round, because if Robertson wins, it will be by submission, it will be by finish. If Rodriguez wins, it will be by decision, most likely. So, um, I've got Rodriguez by decision. And now we move up, we've got TJ Brown taking on Bill Algio. And TJ Brown has looked really good recently, honestly, he's actually impressed me a bit. Well, maybe not super recently, because he did lose to Shea Leonard and Becky. And that's kind of a fight which I like from Shayla Nerdemiki. We saw a lot of grappling in that one. And we saw a lot of maybe like bad grappling decisions from TJ Brown. He put himself in a lot of weird positions. But then he just out like dominated Eric Silva. And Eric Silva, although 36 years old, was actually a guy I was pretty hyped up on. Eric Silva had an incredible Dana White's Contender Series debut. He's looked really good in his career. And then uh, we just saw um, TJ Brown go out and dominate him in his own game. So that was a really good look from TJ Brown. I'm picking Bill Algio though. I like Bill Algio. Bill Al both of these guys are very well-rounded. Both of them very good strikers and grapplers. But I do like Bill Algio in the matchup. I like him on the feet. If it does get to the grappling, Bill Algio is showing incredible, um, incredible submission defense against Herbert Burns. Herbert Burns was throwing up a lot of weird submissions and... Uh, Villagio ended up kind of beating him by TKO. It says exhaustion from damage, but I think Herbert Burns actually injured his leg in that fight, and he's actually had surgery on his knee since then. He did lose to Andre Philly in a very close fight, um, whereas it was just a very close fight. He beat Ioannis and Brito as well, which is a win that has continued to age well as well. Brito just destroyed Lucas Alexander recently. I like Algio. He's got the he's got the size advantage, so he doesn't really have the reach advantage, but he's bigger. He's six foot. I think he can keep the fight at range on the feet if he wants to. TJ Brown might want to initiate some grappling, and if he does, Bill Algio is probably going to be open to that too, because Bill Algio's grappling is pretty good too. So I think both guys are well rounded, but I do have Algio to win by decision in this matchup here. I believe he is a favorite. He is minus one sixty. TJ Brown is about plus one twenty five, plus one thirty. I wouldn't be too surprised if I see people picking. Um, TJ Brown though, honestly. <clears throat> Bruno Brazil taking on Denise Gomez. You've got to kind of go with Bruno Brazil here, Denise Gomez. She's young, she's 23 years old. She fought Loma Lukbumi on short notice and showed pretty good grappling in that fight, but she wasn't able to get it done ultimately, and uh, she did beat Rayani Dos Santos. But that is not really the best look considering how competitive that fight really was. Because Rayana de Santos, all of her wins are pretty much over debuting fighters or fighters with losing records. 
Bruno Brazil's fought good competition. She just KO'd Marnik Man with a pretty brutal head kick. It was 5-0. A lot of people picked Marnik Man as well to win that fight. Uh, she beat a 5-0 girl in LFA. And before that, it wasn't really the best competition in the world. But, you know, she's still fighting arguably better opponents than what uh, Denise Gomez was fighting. You know what I mean? So... I've got Bruno Brazil, Denise Gomez, they're both strikers for the most part is kind of how I would describe their style. Denise Gomez is a bit of a brawler, like she's going to rush forward with boxing combinations, whereas Bruno Brazil, I would probably describe as like a more technical kickboxer, a more technical Muay Thai striker, and I think what Bruno Brazil is going to try and do is just kind of keep the distance, keep the range, and try and out kickbox Denise Gomez for three rounds, and I think she should be able to be successful in that because what Denise Gomez is going to do is just kind of crash forward it's kind of how I would describe what Denise Gomez is probably going to do in this fight so I've got Brazil by decision I don't think she gets another KO she just kind of beat Marnik Man with a head kick it was like honestly I think Marnik Man was like five foot one or something so she was a lot shorter than Brazil and it's kind of easy for her to get the head kick Denise Gomez is also five foot two so maybe you could see a head kick from Brazil again but I've got Bruno Brazil I think she is going to get it done by decision in this matchup we move on up the card. We've got Eon Kutalaba taking on Tina Boza. I think this fight is close. I see a lot of people picking Boza. I'm picking Boza, but I think Eon Kutalaba could be pretty live in this one here. But the problem with Eon Kutalaba, he gasses out after the first. He has a crazy first round, and then he gasses out. It kind of what happens all the time. It happened with Justin Jacoby. He had, a, he, I believe, he teenaged Jacoby in the first round, and then he gassed out. Jacoby took over. Devin Clark, he did beat by decision. That was a pretty good win for him. But then he lost to Span, Walker, and Izajuku. All guys are good, though. All the guys that Kudalaba just lost to are good. Tanner Bozas had a pretty up-and-down run in the heavyweight division. But now he's moving down to 205. He always was a little bit undersized for heavyweight. We kind of saw that recently against Rodrigo Nascimento, who kind of took him down and did not a lot. And it was Tanner Boza doing the more damage on top. But... It was a close fight. I thought Rodrigo Nascimento did win it, though. But, you know, he's had a lot of close fights that arguably could have gone his way. Um, Tano Bosa, that is. But I think moving down to 205 pounds is going to be a good um, step for him. This is actually the second fight he's ever fought in 205. I believe he's fought at uh, 205 once before, way back in the regional scene. But ever since then, it's just going to be... It's just been heavyweight fights. I think Tano Bosa beats Ion Kutalaba. Because Tanner Boza's shown good cardio for a heavyweight throughout his whole career. I think it, the cardio will probably improve fighting at 205 as well. Because he's, I actually watched an interview of him with John Hyun Ko. And he kind of said that he's made a couple of lifestyle changes. Nothing too crazy. But he thinks that his cardio is going to be better at 205. Which is good. And I think that against a guy like Eon Kutalaba who will gas out. He can probably weaponize his cardio and beat him like that. So I do have Tanner Boza to win this matchup um, by KO, actually, in the second or the third round. I think he catches Ion Kutalaba. He hasn't got a KO in a minute, though. I think the last one was... It was over OSP. Sorry, I thought it was over Rafael Pessoa. But I've still got Boza. I do think he gets it done. I think he's a very slight underdog. Maybe that line will flip. You can get him as an underdog now. You can get Kutalaba as an underdog in some sports books as well. It's just a pick-em's fight, really. You can go either way with that one there. We move up the card again. Clay Guida is taking on Huffa Garcia, and I do have Huffa Garcia to beat the legendary Clay Guida. Clay Guida is 41 years old. He's still doing it. He's 60 fights into his professional career. He's still doing it, man. It's crazy. But I do think that Huffa Garcia gets it done. Clay Guida, the way that he wins his fights is almost purely with his wrestling these days. At, at, at this point, it almost is purely with his wrestling. But Huffa Garcia is a wrestler boxer you know he's a boxer on the feet but he also wrestles and I think what he's going to be able to do is keep the fight on the feet against Clay Guida and beat Clay Guida on the feet I think that's going to be a pretty close decision though honestly I think Clay Guida could have a lot of success with the wrestling but Huffa Garcia isn't a bad wrestler himself and Huffa Garcia you know he just beat Mahashati in a fight which took place mostly on the feet and Mahashati is a very good striker underrated fighter in my opinion maybe a guy that says going to have a pretty big um pretty good run is Mahashati but Huffa Garcia beat him in a fight that was mostly on the feet, which was good. He's got boxing and wrestling. Sorry, he's got wrestling in his back pocket. I think he can probably keep the fight on the feet, defend the takedowns of a th against the 41-year-old Clay Guida, who is a cardio machine at this point in his career still. But I think Gar Garcia gets it done. I've got him to win by decision. He is minus 250. Maybe this is a short notice bout. Not all sportsbooks have that fight. Maybe it's just a fight that just got added to the card. 
but I thought it was announced a while ago. But anyway, the point is, I've got half a guess here. Pedro Munoz taking on Chris Gutierrez. I do have... Um, I'm, I'm going with... I'm, go I'm going with Chris Gutierrez, but... I think Pedro Munoz is live, you know, like, but this is coming from a guy that did pick Frankie Edgar to beat uh, Gutierrez, but I had my reasons for that, though. Prior to the Edgar fight, he got teenated by Cody Durden, you know, who's a flyweight. Cody Durden took him down and absolutely dominated him in the first round with the wrestling. He beat Yor, who's a striker, Kolaris, who's not even in the UFC anymore, Danabat Gare by KO, that was a good win too, but he's just purely a striker pretty much. And then he beat uh, Edgar by KO pretty brutally too, but... Munoz, man, if Munoz is smart, if Munoz fights a smart fight, he could definitely beat Chris Gutierrez. But I think at this point, Pedro Munoz is almost 37 years old. I think he's going to get caught by Gutierrez, man. Gutierrez is a powerful striker. His wrestling's not that good, though, because you can take down Gutierrez and dominate him on the ground, and we've seen a flyweight and Cody Durden do that. It was three years ago, I know, two years, eight months ago, but you've still seen that, you know? So I feel like maybe when Chris Gutierrez does fight someone like Ricky Simone, I think Ricky Simone would dominate him in the wrestling department, for example. But Pedro Munoz... He's an older guy now, you know, he didn't look that bad against O'Malley, but then he kind of pulled out through the eye poke, it was weird. He lost to Cruz, but that's a striker. Aldo's kind of just, like, one of the best of all time. Uh, lost to Edgar of a split decision himself. I do have Chris Gutierrez in this one here. I watched the fight back against Frankie Edgar, and Edgar just was really able to get his wrestling off whatsoever. I think Gutierrez gets it done. I think if he beats Munoz, it actually will be by knockout, because I think if Pedro Munoz fights a smart fight, which I don't know if I can still trust him to do. He will just take down Chris Gutierrez and control him on the ground, maybe work his grappling and maybe get a submission. But I've got Gutierrez by KO. I think that's how he gets it done over someone like Pedro Munoz. And he's a pretty big favorite as well. But Munoz, man, mate, Munoz might be live. You know, I'm not that sold on Gutierrez. You've got to look at the competition that he's fought. You know, compare it between the two. Before he beat Frankie Edgar, who's 40 years old himself, it was Dana Bakare. Felipe Calares is not in the UFC anymore. Andre Yule who's not in the UFC anymore. And Cody Durden, who's a flyweight. Pedro Munoz just fought Dominic Cruz, former champion. Jose Aldo, former champion. Jimmy Rivera, a great guy at the time. Uh, and Frankie Edgar, former champion. So I know Chris Gutierrez fought Edgar too. But anyway, you know what I mean. I'm picking Gutierrez by KO. I think he gets it done by KO. I think that's how he wins. But I think it's a closer fight than a lot of people might say it is. The next one is Dustin Jacoby taking on Azamat Mozakhanov. And I think we're going to see Dustin Jacoby just outpoint Azamat Mozakhanov. Maybe even try and get a finish. Because uh, Jacoby, it wasn't the best de decision against um, Khalil Roundtree, man. I wouldn't actually mind them um, just doing a rematch for that fight. Or maybe, I don't know, because like, I think Jacoby won that fight. I, I don't think the decision was like the worst of all time, like a lot of people kind of think it is. But it was a bad decision. It was a decision that Jacoby won. But, dude, um, Azamat Mozakhanov, he's a good striker and he's a good wrestler, but he's 34. We saw him losing to Tough One and Chukwe until he got the flying knee, which is a red flag. He did KO Devin Clark and we kind of dominated him, which is a good win. But it is Devin Clark. Devin Clark's gone on to lose since then. Um, Dustin Jacoby is a very good striker, former glory kickboxer. And um, he's had a really good run. He beat Daun Young by KO, which is a good win. He beat Mikhail Alkshashuk, who's a pure boxer, and he was injured in that fight. The He beat the PED GOAT, John Allen. And uh, Darren Stewart, who's not in the UFC anymore, but still not that bad of a win. And the thing with Dustin Jacoby is he's a glory kickboxer. He's a very good kickboxer. That's kind of how he fights. And I think he's going to outpoint Azamat Mirzakhanov. Azamat Mirzakhanov, he might go for takedowns, but Jacoby's got good takedown defense. Azamat Mirzakhanov, you know, as I was saying, he was getting outpointed on the feet by Tuffin and Chukwi, of all people on the feet. He's a shorter guy. He's only 5'10". He probably could fight at middleweight if he really wanted to, whereas Jacoby's 6'3 with a 78-inch reach. I think he's going to utilize that and just outpoint Mirzakhanov for three rounds and uh, win clearly, or win by finish. Maybe Jacoby, like, starts throwing, like, heat kicks and stuff to try and finish Mirzakhanov to really put a statement down, but... Jacoby's about minus 200. I think Azamat Mirzakhanov as well is a little bit overrated. I was on Instagram, and someone kind of made, like, a list of, like, the best fighters that aren't in the top five for every single weight class, and in light heavyweight, they put Mirzakhanov. Like, dude, like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> there's a bit of bias going on there. Like, Jesus Christ, like... Mazzucano's about to lose to Jacoby, who I don't even know of his ranks right now. Um, so yeah, I've got Jacoby by decision. 
We move on. I think we get a phone call, but Edson Barboza taking on Billy Quarantillo. I'm going with the 37-year-old Edson Barboza to get it done. I like Billy Quarantillo, I do. But dude, Edson Barboza is Edson Barboza. You know what I mean? He's a great striker. I know he got dropped by Bryce Mitchell, but in that fight, Barboza really was terrified of the takedown. He 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 truly was. And I think that was definitely half the reason why he did get dropped by Bryce. He got dominated in the wrestling by that fight. Um, he lost to Giga Chikansi, which I guess isn't the best look, especially um, in recency. But he beat Shane Burgos in that weird KO. Michael Namakani, but Michael Namakani gasses after the first. He, he beat Dan Ige too. That was a terrible decision as well. That was that was that was a worse decision in my opinion. The Dan Ige Edson Barboza decision than the Jacoby um, Roundtree decision. But anyway, um, Billy Quarantillo. I think he could be live. I think he's the underdog as well. Or is uh, Edson Barboza might be the un underdog. Edson Barboza is the underdog. Plus 140 on some sports books. That's interesting. But I like Barboza. I think he's going to be the better pure striker. Billy Q, he's always in fight of the nights. He's such an exciting fighter. He did just beat Alexander Hernandez. But Hernandez was having success until he gassed out completely after the first round. And if, it's, if Alexander Hernandez can have success, Edson Barboza can have success on the feet for sure. He did lose to Shane Burgess, but that was an absolute wild fight. Probably one of the, the best fight of the year, maybe, potentially. Benitez, you know, but Benitez is a bit chinny, unfortunately. I do like Edson Barboza to beat Billy Q in this matchup. I like him to beat Billy Q by decision as well. I think it's going to be a war, maybe a fight of the night. But the problem is, if we do get a war and we do get a fight of the night... Edson Barboza's 37 years old. He's taken a lot of damage in his career. And it's just going to be like... Edson Barboza's going to wear the damage worse, in my opinion, um, than Billy Q would. But I think we're going to get a fight of the night. I think we're going to get a fight of the year candidate as well. It's going to be crazy, this fight. But I think Barboza is going to out um, kickbox him for three rounds. I would be surprised if we got a finish. If we did get a finish, it genuinely might be on the Edson Barboza side, or the Billy... Jeez, oh, it could go either way. <laughs> it's going to be by KO. This fight's going to take place on the feet. It's going to be crazy. But speaking of crazy fights, you got Max Holloway making his big return against Arnold Allen. And I do believe that Max Holloway is going to win this one by decision, by winning the last three rounds. Arnold Allen loves to break his hand. I'm not relying on Arnold Allen breaking his hand, though, but... Max Holloway, he's got crazy cardio, he weaponizes cardio, he throws insane volume, he receives insane volume, he's received the most shots, um, significant strikes in UFC history without getting knocked down, but I still don't think that's the biggest compliment you can give him because, you know, that damage is going to add up over time. Max Holloway, absorbing the most significant strikes in UFC history without getting knocked down is super impressive. But you've got to think, that's a lot of damage, you know, and that damage is going to add up at one point. But Holloway's still young, he's 31 years old. I think Arnold Allen could maybe catch him, but I think if he catches him, it'll be in the first two rounds. I think Holloway wins a 48-47 decision by winning the last three rounds. I mean, there's not really a lot of evidence to prove that Arnold Allen isn't ready for five-round fights. There's not a lot of evidence to prove that Arnold Allen's just going to completely gas out. But I think what Holloway is going to do, I think he's going to work the body in the first two rounds, and he's going to outbox Arnold Allen for the last three. I'm not that confident in it, though, because I, I genuinely do believe that's a real thing. Max Holloway has taken a lot of damage in his career, and a lot of fights. You know, he took a lot of damage against Volkanovski. He took a lot of damage against Dustin Poirier. I believe he's fought Poirier twice and took a lot of damage in that fight. You know, it's like, he's had such a good career, um, Max Holloway has. He really has, but... The damage is going to add up. I don't know if it's going to add up in this fight, though. I think he beats Arnold Allen. I kind of want Arnold Allen to win. Not because I don't like Holloway. I actually am um, a Max Holloway fan. I'm not the biggest fan in the world. I know Holloway's got a pretty crazy uh, fan base. But I kind of want Arnold Allen to win for the main reason is the title picture will be quite new and fresh. Because if uh, Volkanovski beats Yaya Rodriguez and Max Holloway beats Arnold Allen... Like, who do you give Volkanovski next? Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things. Whereas if uh, Arnold Allen beats Holloway, Volkanovski's like, got to fight Arnold Allen, right? Like, Arnold Allen absolutely deserves the, the shot if he beats Holloway. So, I do have Holloway, though. I think he wins by decision. I think he outpoints Arnold Allen by winning the last three rounds. 48-47. Arnold Allen, you know, um, I think he's going to get it done. And the thing is, with Max Holloway, you know, the only guys that have managed to beat him in the last three years have been Alexander Volkanovsky. You know, he beat Calvin Cater on the feet badly. He beat Yoya Yo Yo Rodriguez in a fight, to be fair, that was close. 
closer than a lot of people probably want to admit. He was shooting, shooting for takedowns against Yaya Rodriguez to, to secure rounds at points because Yaya was looking good on the feet against him as well. But I just think with the style that Yaya has and the style Arnold Allen has, they're completely different styles, you know, and I think that Holloway will be able to beat. Arnold Allen, I think it will outbox him in the last three rounds. I think Arnold Allen will have a lot of success in the first two, but I think Mike Holloway will be able to get it done in the last three rounds.